How is everybody doing today? Look at all this melanin in the audience. Um, we're really excited to be here. My name is Abiel Alke. I'm the CEO of Adisa Advisory. We're a strategic advisory firm that um, supports companies at the intersection of media, entertainment, and technology. And uh, I'm really honored to speak on something that's really dear to all of us, and it's the power of storytelling, narratives, and how increasingly borderless our ability to tell stories, share stories, and, and change how we see ourselves are. And uh, I'd like my fellow friends and panelists here to introduce themselves, starting with Love. Hi, I'm Lovey Jai Jones, and I am a New York Times bestselling author, speaker, and- Four time. Four time, amen. <laughs> Uh, speaker and podcast host, and I thrive at the intersection of culture, leadership, and business. And I'm excited to be here with some of my besties. You know, it's gonna be a good conversation. Clap, clap. Hello, everyone. My name is Justino Mukwa. I'm the SVP of a little company called Parkwood Entertainment. Slight word. Yes. There's a lot going on right now, but uh, I'm here with you. I am very happy to be here, and I look forward to a great conversation with friends. Okay. <laughs> and she's comfortable in her skin. Very. Hey. Get it? Yeah. Uh, I'm Bozma St. John. I am a uh, world renowned. Come on, Hall of Famer. Hall of Fame inducted marketer. Uh, I've been the CMO of Netflix, uh, Endeavor, Uber, head of global marketing at Apple Music and iTunes, and head of entertainment at PepsiCo. And I'm an author of The Urgent Life and a general badass. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so let's dig into it. So we're gonna take, you know, we're gonna take a round table approach here. We're gonna talk like we talk in the WhatsApps and the DMs. Hey, oh. that's a disaster. Right. Uh -oh. okay. Let's let's keep it real. All right. So a lot has happened since the pandemic. Corporations have made commitments to fund and empower black creators and storytellers. A lot of those companies have fallen short. Let's talk about where we go from here. Do we want to address why they've fallen short? Let's talk well, about it. Okay. Well, one is I think that uh, oftentimes people see black people as a monolith. Um, and so it falls short there to see that, for people not to see that there is diversity within blackness, right? Whether it's your sexual orientation, your country of origin, your difference of opinion, your education, there's, there's so much to see and oftentimes it's just black. And so it's, well, I had one black person in the room and surely they represent the masses or it's in response to something that has happened that is terrible and so it's, okay, I'm going to do this thing to say that, you know, I love black people or I'm okay with black people. The intent behind it is not um, based on an infrastructure that allows for something to be sustainable. And that's why you see a lot of these uh, initiatives are falling short. Also, Black Square Summer was a performance. Mm. I remember the day that the Black Squares were going up. If y'all remember, the call to action that day was for us to boycott social media. I thought that was ridiculous because you're gonna tell black people to be more quiet in a world that silences us? I instantly was like, absolutely not. If there's anybody to be quiet, it's not us. If there's anybody to tap out of social media for a day, it's not us. So as all the brands started putting up black squares, I was calling bullshit. Because it was the most non-statement statement of all time. And then all of a sudden, you start seeing brands that never did anything, all black square, and then they all had this like boilerplate, uh, oh my gosh, we stand with black people. The fact that two years, three years, actually, it's been three years, that none of them have, a lot of them have not fulfilled their pledges is not shocking because that was all a performance. What did executive boards look like? What was the turnover of their black and brown you know, teams? They did not mean to do anything. And because they counted on us not having an attention span, because that's often the case, they got away with it and are getting away with it now. And I think where we need to be is figuring out how we can really hold them accountable to all the things that they said they would do in 2020 and beyond. Because what we're seeing also now is a DEI backlash. A bunch of DEI officers who were hired in 2020 are no longer in their jobs. 
they have like one year roles and all of a sudden they're leaving because they realize the company was not doing anything. So yeah, this was not a shock. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Boz, you got any thoughts I thought you were going to ask me a new question. I mean, I was going to ask <laughs> No, a these, question. these two are so brilliant. They I feel brilliant. like they answered the question so well. See? So, so, so what do you say, and, and I like to play devil's advocate here, right? What do you say that there's too much of an over, there's too much of a reliance on corporates and entities that don't validate us. And we can do the work to validate ourselves, to oh. work together, pool our resources, all of that. Yes, but, okay. Know? So see, this is why you're so brilliant, you eh? Know, yeah, my because you're just iterating on the question. In fact. It's so good. In fact. In fact. Ah. Oprah yes, Winfrey who? In fact. I woke up like this. Yeah, hey. you did Aish. Wait, is Fine that boy. what we're going to do? We're going to drop Beyonce lyrics in time. <laughs> the whole time. OK, very good, very good. OK. So me as a brown-skinned girl, um, <laughs> there, there have been too many times when I have been in the Monday morning meeting after some campaign or product we have put out, and by the way, specifically targeted towards us, and the results are not what were expected. And then what happens? We roll it back. We say, oh, it didn't perform. The challenge is that most of the time, when it is not specifically targeted towards us, you let something breathe. You know, give us some time to pick up steam. Everybody will find an excuse. They'll say, oh, well, the market this and that. Oh, well, the weather. That was why they didn't watch the show. Or that's why they didn't, you know, pick up the product and give it some time to breathe. It does not happen with us. And so part of what you're asking, I think, is our own responsibility in not just relying on corporations to make the changes or to do the thing. We have to support, too. You know, I think so many times I've been in these conversations where, of course, like, look, the entertainment world, the product world, they're not perfect in terms of what they are delivering to us, right? We know that. We want more intentionality, and even to what Justina was saying about um, you know, knowing that we're not a monolith, we want more diversity within the stories of blackness. Yes. However, if we don't support what we have, we won't get more. That's the problem. So it's like, if you're gonna consume entertainment, whether that is film, or sport, or music, or hell, pick anything, please make sure that, hell, I don't care if you turn on the TV and just let it run. You know, we've got to support the things, and that's how then we encourage even more change, because then what happens is, and Love, you know this from even your books, you know, four-time New, four New York Times bestseller will tell you, yes, that the next time a black woman comes into that meeting to present or to pitch her book that is nonfiction, somebody will say, oh, it's like a Lovey Ajay Jones book. You know what I mean? And they'll reference that. And so it's like, if you're going to do anything, purchase her book, gift it to somebody else. You know, watch the show, even if you don't agree with the entire storyline. Listen to the music, play some Afro beats, please. You know, so that we have even more reliance on the fact that our numbers really do work, but we have to support our content. Yes. Abby, Abby let me ask you this question real quick. And then Justine, because I know Abby needs to get in. Yeah. So when, you, when you're asking the question of, how do we build our own table? What is the barrier of entry? You know, I, thank you, Justine. I mean, Lovey. I think the reality is that we have to think about the opportunity outside of our culture and race, right? The truth is that, you know, I say this about BET, for example, right? Uh, we've all seen the show Atlanta. Atlanta is on FX, right? Brilliant show. Uh, Issa Rae, uh, um, Insecure. Insecure was on HBO. Why isn't the best black content on the black networks? Mm. Why not? Exactly. <laughs> so what I find as our challenge is, we're not even doing the best black content on the platforms that we have influence in. Mm. Because what we should be able to do is also cater to non-black consumers, because it's a numbers game, yes. We know racism is institutional, but it's also a numbers game. It's 43 million black people in the United States accounted for, right? Of that number, something like 60% of our, mark, um, of our uh, spending is actually on things like milk, detergent. It's not on discretionary. 
And so we do have this purchasing power, but it's limited. And so if I'm a brand, if I say, okay, I'm going to spend a million dollars on BET, well, but that same eyeball is going to watch content on FX. Why do I have to spend twice? And so when our platforms are creating content, we really need to think, okay, how as a black creator can I get that Italian audience, that German audience? And I think if we spread out who we target, perhaps we can have more agency in the marketplace. I, I want to I challenge that. Okay. I think that um, oftentimes we believe that we have to do things for other people when we actually are. The reality is that when you can look up, check your phone, look at the charts. When you look at music, we dominate, right, in terms of what popular music is. The eyeballs are there. The people are in the, the, they're in the stadiums and the arenas, and they don't necessarily look like us. Right. We are the culture. Right. We right. are the moment. But I do agree with you is that our platforms, we need to, we need to bolster our platforms because if we build it, they will come they because will come. they're already there. Right. And what they do is they look and they replicate. And so what we need to stop is giving, giving away our secrets. Mm. That's really what happens. Is you, need to, you need to stop going to the panel where they don't pay you <laughs> for your ideas mm. so that they can know, go, go rebuild them or consulting on a project because they want your perspective, but they don't want to give you money mm. and where they replicate your idea. And you know, it, it, the, the, the challenge is, is that we, don't, we need to recognize our power and activate against it and, and stop. I'm not worried about them. I want us to worry about us. us yes. exactly. I have a thought also, um, which is that, so you brought up the, the issue of BET, right? And I also want us to consider the domino effects. So this is kind of expanding on my last point, which is that when was the last time you watched BET? You know, when was the last time you watched it? Comic View? But, here, but, <laughs> but you know what, you know what, but this is the truth of it, right? Because look, BET exists to get advertising dollars to run its program, right? Programming doesn't get the money unless there is a coffer from advertising. Right. Advertising comes because the numbers show that people are engaging on the network. And so therefore, if I'm PepsiCo or I'm Nike or I'm whatever, I'm going to spend where the audience is. If there's no audience on BET, I'm not going to spend my money there, which means that the programming team is not going to have money to develop the content that you want to watch. And so that's my point, which is that like sometimes I realize that it feels very circular and it feels like, oh my God, well, why can't we get this on this? And why couldn't we get this show on? Well, we're not even there anyway. So my challenge again is that like, throw on some BET, put it on, watch it, get those numbers up. And then advertisers are gonna come, which means the programs will have more money and then they'll go get the next ESA. I mean, it's the chicken before the egg syndrome, right? But then there comes the piece that I think is also something we have to interrogate as a people, how we, one, do not expect elevation from each other. Uh -huh. That is a big problem, the ways in which we do not show up for each other like we should. We talked about this probably yesterday when we were talking about the numbers game and what happens when we realize our power in just the way we, we dictate what's cool, we dictate what the rest of the world is doing. So then when we are not expecting a certain level from each other and then showing up for each other, so even when you think about black businesses, right? When we think about how we even treat black businesses, the way when somebody messes up at Target on your behalf, you're like, oh, that was just one cashier. But let a black business not ship your product for a week and a half, you taking it to Instagram. <laughs> Child, this is why I don't shop here all the time. I'm like, what happened? Who hurt you? The grace that we have in the world for everybody else, the ways we allow other people to talk to us, where we'd be like, why she just do that to me? How are we actually showing up for each other, giving each other grace so that we can take more risks? Because that's the other piece. The rewards that we want to come can't come without risks. Can't come without us actually taking these big bets that might not work out, and then us being able to forgive when the person falls. Yeah. So whether music, books, television, business, I think the way that we interact with commerce, black commerce, is so different from how we interact with everybody else. Uh, yeah. Lovey, I couldn't agree more. I mean, Adam Newman, who was the founder of WeWork, raised $300 million from Andreessen for a new company. 
a new company after fumbling a billion dollar bag. And so my, and I'll say this real quick, my issue isn't that they've done that. It's that to your point, we don't do that for ourselves. We don't do that for ourselves. Can I, I want to go back to the BET conversation because I think it, 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 um, it requires us to be introspective. We are talking about one company because again, we want BET to represent yes, all, of, right. uh, all of us and all right. of our ideas. Yeah, yeah. And I'm saying we need more BETs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you understand yeah. what I'm saying? So that if your bag is uh, Atlanta, then you go with that. Or if your bag is insecure, then you go with that. Or if your bag is comic view or whatever it is, you go with that. And I think that oftentimes, again, it's grouped as black and we are different. And so we need mm -hmm. space for different. Yep. I want the thing that is sci-fi. I want the thing that is Afro Afrofuturism. Mm -hmm. I want the thing that is artsy fartsy. I want the thing that is, you know, different. And yet, oftentimes, we get pushed into one corner. Let me ask you a question. So we're talking about borderless storytelling, right? Yes. Our beauty is our diversity. But is the, the question is, is our diversity a challenge for scale? Hmm. No, because it's not a challenge for scale and whiteness. You know, and when we look at the diaspora, there, to Justina's point, there's an opportunity for so much more, you know, to serve in different ways. And what I think is interesting is that, like, if there were, let's say, a music channel that was really just music, right, which served our music choices, imagine, like, the kind of programming we would have, right? Because think about the breadth of music that would be programmed on such a network. You know, even without the, like, other content. You know, just, just music videos. Right. Yeah. And so how then are we able to, and look, nobody gets brownie points for not being just, you know, one-sided, right? Monolithic. And so if it is able to be solved for whiteness, why can't it be solved for blackness? Absolutely. I also want to offer that most of our perspective comes from an American lens. Mm, and when you sure. go, when you leave America, the conversation of blackness is very different. Right. When you head to the continent, every, I mean, most people are black, right? And so there's not this conversation of, how black am I, or I need to sit in a black corner. We were, we were all recently in Amsterdam, and I need to like bring this full circle, the conversation around dance music. Mm. That originates with us. Mm. But in America, it's like a controversial topic. It's like we have to reclaim it. And when you go to Amsterdam, like if it's do, 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 it's, it's us, <laughs> right? And we're leading that charge. And, and yet in America, I feel like we have to reclaim everything. And, and, and if we do, then let's do it, yeah. right? Yeah. And let's not say in one space. We have a question. A question for you all. Um, thank you so much. I think we can learn a lot from you on this idea of a group platform. So my name is Lola. I'm a senior advisor in marketing strategies. Um, and recently I've been contemplating the kind of scary reality that I'm noticing it's easier to get platformed by white spaces like an HBR, like a fast company, versus getting a call black from my people, from a blavity, from et cetera. So what is our collective responsibility to be looking out for each other, and why does it sometimes seem like access is easier yeah. um, when you're not going through a black space? It's been my experience. So you want to take this one? Here. Uh, uh, I can talk so much about that. I think. Um, Part of the challenge is resource. So I, I, I'll give you a nugget. Uh, I ran a media company, and it was really challenging. And I put, to, I, put on C, I put on the hat of CEO. And a friend of mine said, when you're a black executive, you're not a CEO, you're a politician. And the reason is because, and it, it made sense because when you have a story, when people come to our media company, they're coming to me with a certain familiarity and an expectation that I'm going to help. If you're going to the New York Times to get an article, you approach it a little differently. And this is not to say that black media companies should be left off the hook in terms of telling our stories, but that's one resource to, to Bose's point about, it's like one BET, right? And, and, and black media companies are also required to tell the full gamut of black stories Whereas you can have a fast company that talks about one very specific vertical or wired that talks about 
tech and you know you have all these magazines that have all these verticals whereas black media companies are required to tell a gamut of stories and to Bose's point again about advertising without being able to get the same advertising resources and so black media companies are being forced to do so much more right be um, essence has to put on a whole festival to, to even make the business model work right uh, and Financial Times doesn't really have to do that you know, they, they're subscriber base and but and the last thing I'll say is our media platforms are also heavily indexed on lifestyle which is a little different so so that's also a great point to the lack of us being a monolith, we end up being viewed as being interested in the same type of content over and over again. Yesterday I was talking about how, for example, in books, publishing is more comfortable giving us deals that are circulated around racism in America or blackness in America than they are about having you write a book about leadership or a business or joy or love, okay? And it's because we keep on being placed in these boxes and when they say that's the box for you, so yeah, lifestyle. They're like, yes, we would love for you to do a lifestyle. No, where's a technology company that is really gonna focus on blackness and black people and our needs? So I think it's all part of the greater idea of them putting us in these tiny cages and then us not knowing how to break out of it. And we're seeing the reflections in all sorts of industries. I think it's important I'm not saying that anybody needs to go into a company and like be Richard Wright or Rashonda Righteousness, but I think it is, it's important that when you are in the building that we are having these conversations. When, when, the, when the George Floyd conversation was circulating for us, Bose and I happened to be at the same company at the time, there was a lot of like, tell us what you think. And I was like, I don't have all the answers for all the black people. I could tell you how I feel about being here I could tell you about how I feel walking down the street, but if you want me to be a black spurt, I can't do that for you. And I think that it's important that in the companies and in the spaces that we occupy, it's okay to say, I don't know, or it's okay to say, don't ask me that question, go read a book. Mm. Hi. Somebody has a question. Stand up. Okay. Um, good afternoon, my name is Abby Lynn Gonzalez. I'm a Dilla University student. Um, I wanted to talk about the BET topic and the fact that BET was owned by white people for so long. And seeing that Tyler Perry recently bought it out to be the owner, how do you think that's going to change the narrative of black people being a monolith? I don't know that that deal is complete yet. I know that we're hearing the report. I don't think that it's finalized. Um, but go ahead, Lovey. So, I think... <laughs> One, th one thing we all have to also understand is white ownership is not necessarily white control all the time. There's layers to what BET has had to go through for the last 20 years. Yeah. How Tyler is gonna shift it, if he ends up being the owner of BET, I think that's gonna be interesting to watch. Yeah, and it's also, again, I, I how do I wanna put it? It's like, I want us to actually understand our own power. Yes. You know that like when we talk about, again, it's like white ownership or what is being improved, it's like, look, we, again, I think maybe the overarching theme is that we have to support our own things. We don't do that enough. And so we keep pointing somewhere else and saying, well, why don't they do this? And why don't they do that? And how will it change? With it? And I'm like, but you're not watching it. You know, you're not even supporting it. So how are we going to say whether or not Tyler is going to change the whole thing? You know, I, I think it would be wonderful if he owns it. He's done such a magnificent job of content, but he's also doing one type of content. You know, so that doesn't even speak to all of us, which is fine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But again and again, we've said on this panel that we have more power than sometimes we assign ourselves. You know, and I recognize the fact that it feels sometimes like, you know, just overwhelming, like there's nothing you can do. But if we look around at the creators who are even here and can, you know, it's like, how many of us are going to leave here and be supportive of somebody else's creativity? We're all doing a lot of networking, you mean a lot of people. It's like, how are you supporting them? Oh, and by the way, can we also take it out of just the creative space and support executives? How many in this audience are executives at a company? Okay, so you looking around the people who hold, who holding up their hands, 
we are leaving in droves. And my contention is always, and we've had a lot of these conversations when I left Netflix a year ago, uh, everybody said, oh, well, why don't you start your own thing? And I'm like, that's not really what I want to do. You know, that's not, that's not what I want to do. I think being an entrepreneur is a fantastic thing, and I wish everybody well who does that, but that's not necessarily my bag. I don't understand why we can't own the things that somebody else has built. Why, why do I need to go build it myself? I'm like, no, I'm going to come, come take your shit. You know what I mean? Like, you, you built that, I'm coming to get it. So we're not digging around. And so it's like, yes, I, I <laughs> what'd you say? <laughs> he said, so we're not digging around. No. <laughs> we're not at all. We're coming to get it. We're coming to get everything they said we couldn't have. And so the point that I'm making is that, um, you know, if there are people around you that you know are struggling, even in their decision-making position, executive positions at the companies in which they are struggling in, let's support each other in that too, right? Because in order for us to see those changes anywhere, not just in our own spaces, but in other people's own spaces, we have to support us who are in there. You know, and we all know that shit ain't easy. So it's like, I want to support Justina and what she's doing, although she's working for a black company, but I still want to support her, Amen. you know? And I want to make sure that executives who are in these spaces are still supported so they don't leave. Right. We need to get more to the top and therefore we can have more decision-making power. And, and Bose, and then, I know he has a question. Um, what I'll say is, I love, I love our diversity. I love, I love that. But one of the legacies of racism is convincing us that we are a monolith. Mm. And the reality is, is that when the young lady asks about BET, it kind of goes back to this, well, because we're a monolith, we need one platform to represent everything we do. Yeah. I used to work with a lot of very young African uh, entrepreneurs, and they would always say, I want to build the Netflix of Africa. I want to build the Spotify of Africa. And I'm like, just build the Spotify competitor and just do African music or African content better on that platform than Spotify can. Yeah. You don't have to build the African Spotify wait, because you're Abiola, limiting your time. You just said something so powerful, though. I know I don't give you compliments enough. <laughs> but <laughs> I want to underline that because I think that is so easy to do. Say, I want to build a Netflix of Africa. But I love what you just said about building the competitor right. to Netflix, right? That's it right. changes the perspective on That's what right. it is that you're trying to do. We're not trying to be friends. I'm trying to take your shit. That's right. That's but right. See, doesn't like that, you. Like but doesn't that. that speak to the fact that we also put ourselves in cages? Look. Why do. you got to build the Spotify in Africa? You know what I'm right. saying? Like, part of the legacy of slavery is the fact that, I mean, just actually, imperialism, colon, colonialism, all of those things are working hand in hand to tell us that we're smaller than we are. Yeah. So small is thinking you have to build the, net, the Spotify that already exists just for Africa, as yeah. opposed to saying, I'm going to transform yes. the industry. Into the competitor. I yes. will compete with you I'm and come for your neck. Head. I'm going to go head to head with you. Yes. And, and you know, I'll say I another love thing. That. Even Calendly. Calendly, exactly. Uh, talk about Tawodi, right? He just built a calendar platform, a meeting platform. What I also want to see, if What's there are that? any filmmakers and storytellers in the audience, I want to see what we imagine the future with uh, with us the defining the future looks like, mm. right? A lot of the technological innovations we see today are kids that grew up on science fiction films trying to realize that imagination that was planted in them when they were younger. Come on. For us, what does the future look like? We're very consumed with the past and the present, which is great, but we really need to start thinking about what does the future look like with us in it? Mm -hmm. What's, who's, mm -hmm. you know, who, I want to know who the young black Elon Musks are, the, you know, I want to know who they are. Why and do they got to be Elon Musk? Hey. Yeah, Justin is Elon Musk. Come, Come on, to on Elon. and give it to us. The competitor to Elon. Madame, give it to us one yes. more time. Yeah. In fact, Drag the us, competitor please. to Elon. Yeah. Yeah. But I, who's going to go head to head? I think that sometimes we have the thought, but we got to apply it to ourselves. It's very, right. what do they say when you point one finger, there are three pointing back at you? And so I think it's great. We have to evaluate how we've been indoctrinated, right? How does imperialism, colonialism, all the isms, how do they affect us and how we see ourselves and how we operate in the world? Yeah. I want to be me and the best version of me. I'm not trying to be anybody Hell else. Yeah. And, I, I, and I wish that for everybody here. Be the best version of yourself. You don't need to be Bose or Lovey or Abiola. Those roles are already taken. Done. Be the best version of yourself. Yeah. No, I want those little white boys to say they want to be the next Bose. <laughs> hey. Fuck out of here. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. I want to be like, yeah. I want them to say it. I mean, I support that. 
I think they should. In fact, but I, they couldn't be the next boats because the cargo shorts and the, the lack of flavor yeah. is just how not could giving. They put the, how could they pull it's this off? It's not giving. In okay? fact, it's not giving. I'm trying to. <laughs> I think we're we're close think, on time though, yeah. Abiola. Are we closing on time? We're closing on time, I okay. think. But I know um, someone in the audience has a question that they want to ask. Hi. 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 Hi guys, hi everyone. Thank you so much for being on this panel. It's so inspirational. I'm personally really inspired right now. Um, and it's actually kind of fitting that I'm asking this question at the closing of time because you guys all got to where you are, you know, through the power of showing something, so showing something to someone that doesn't exist yet, right? So I'm curious to see if you guys could share any advice, you know, because like that's what we're called upon to do all the time as black people, and even more specifically in advertising and media, you know. I am thinking about a conversation I had last week. I, I'm constantly advocating for hiring more black women creative directors because I believe black women are like one of the most creative people in the world. Yep. And people are like, but where? Where are they? And I'm like, they're everywhere. Walking right, we're, we're right here. So I want you guys to share any advice you guys have of, you know, convincing people of things to believe in things that don't exist yet. Does that, you guys are getting okay. what I'm getting at. Thank you. I'll start. Um, the, the art of convincing is to convince yourself. If you don't believe that you're the best, you're not going to evoke that you're the best in the room. And it starts with, like, I don't believe that there can be any other version of me than the version that I bring to the table. And the version that I bring is especially special. And I use this uh, adage always, or this, uh, this thing that my mother taught me, is that all fingers are not equal, but they each serve a purpose. Mm. The pinky can't do what the thumb does. The thumb can't do what the middle finger does. Mm. The middle finger can't do what the ring finger does. And so to that end, you have to be you and do what you do because nobody else can do that. And I think that the idea of convincing is a, is a slippery slope for me. It's, it's either you're gonna get it or you're not. And sometimes they're not, but let that motivate you because they will eventually and those will be, look, because you shall be the head and not the tail. Do you Come understand on. what I'm saying? Okay, it's like, you gotta, be, you gotta be confident that if they don't get it, they will get it. Yeah. yeah, and I and I don't believe people invest in ideas. They invest in people. So my tactic over the years is no matter what it is that I want to do, whatever idea I have, if they trust in me, the person of integrity and, ex and excellence consistently, they will bet on me because I am not a risky bet. Mm. So that's how I approach any room, whether I'm pitching a new book to my publishers when they're like, hey, what's the next idea? And I'm like, listen, it's a half-assed idea. I'm not sure. They go, yes. They might not say yes to somebody who has an amazing idea because they don't believe in them, but me with a half idea, but because they believe in me, they say yes. So if you want to get more yeses, be somebody who is not a risky bet. Know that when you show up in the room, you're going to kill it. You're going to over deliver on your promise. So whenever somebody says, yes, I will make that phone call for you for that job. Yes, you can do this random project that you want. They're really betting on you, the person. So how are you showing up and making sure you're vouchable? and reliable so you are never a risky bet. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, you are in the most, one of the most amazing places in the world with some of the most amazing people doing the most amazing things. What I'm saying is meet as many people as possible. Meet people before you need anything or can offer any value to them. And the thing to think about when you meet people is always keep in mind what problem can I solve? Everyone at every level has a problem that they're trying to solve. And if you can be the bridge between getting their problem solved in some capacity, you're gonna win every time. Yes. Yeah. Bring us home, Bose. Oh, up. bring us home. Go to Ghana. <laughs> <laughs> and then East Naja Jalof after. Yes. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so Thank much. You Thank you, everyone. Thank you, so Thank you all. Ha <laughs> <laughs>